and Defiance this week on The Laura Flanders Show. We are joined by award-winning playwright and essayist Wally Shawn, who has a new book of essays he calls his Night Thoughts. Meditations and speculative dreams for a better world from the tales of Genji to libraries and the power of fiction. And Ed Whitfield from the Fund for Democratic Communities in Greensboro, North Carolina, has a few thoughts on cooperatives, consumer politics, and impeachments. All that, and I have a few thoughts on monuments. Where are the monuments to the motley crew? It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. It is my tremendous pleasure to have Wally Sean back with us here in the studio. Wally is out with a new book. And Wally, not to embarrass you, but I do want to read from the very beginning of the publisher's weekly review, which was a starred review because it really, well, it, it sets it up. Sean, an actor, an Obie-winning playwright, reflects on civilization, morality, Beethoven, 11th century Japanese court poetry, and his hopes for a better word, world, among other topics. <laughs> 11th century romantic, I mean, Japanese court poetry, really? Well, ever since I was in my early, early 20s, I, I have uh, thought a lot about the world depicted in the tale of Genji, um, which is uh, always seemed like a very agreeable and ideal life very unlike the one that uh, either people who are poor today or people who are rich today enjoy. Uh, the characters had a lot of love affairs and sat around on these lovely pillows and wrote uh, poems basically all day long. Uh, on very nice uh, colored paper. And uh, I suppose it comes up in my book because that's how human beings could live conceivably, but uh, they don't. It comes up because the book basically is everything that I've ever thought summarized. Well, really. it is a very slim volume. Yes. So. Is that your night thought, that you could wake up and be a member of the Japanese court? What, what are your night thoughts? Well, I suppose the, the, the book is a meditation on uh, the possibility of a better world and how we might uh, possibly get there or what it might be like if we did get there. And uh, I suppose it uh, sweeps away layers of obstacles to achieving that uh, happy state. I mean, it, it doesn't, it's not, it's a political book in a way, but it takes for granted that somehow Trump is gone and somehow the planet will survive long enough to improve. I guess I, because I'm not going to live that much longer due to my age, uh, I, I'm not embarrassed to offer speculative dreams about what a better world could be. Well, I, I am interested in you using the word embarrassed, because I've noticed, and maybe you have too, I mean, I think there's nothing more political than us putting forward our dreams and our vision. I think it's the muscle we need to exercise more in these times. And yet I've noticed, and it's true for myself too, that if someone asks me, or if I ask you about your dream of a future, more often than not, they tear up. More often than not, they're moved, I think it is sort of to embarrassment. 
Why? What's the embarrassment about? Well, the obstacles to, to a better world are so uh, enormous. Uh, and I guess in, in my book, I talk about the human psychology obstacles quite a bit. Uh, obviously, the rich of the world have a very powerful grip. And uh, I don't really believe in uh, violence. I don't have a tremendous faith in uh, killing the rich. And uh, the gradual approach to dislodging them seems too gradual. So, so the embarrassment is simply that you're embarrassed that you don't have a logical, practical plan for all the steps to get us from here to there? I think it's deeper than that. I think we actually are kind of embarrassed to believe that something better is possible. It's about the belief, I think. Well, I think uh, it is embarrassing to, to be the person who uh, dreams of things being better when you can't get them to be better. I mean, for instance, in the book, I allude to the possibility that there might be a way of getting rid of people, of upper class people, without killing them uh, through a sort of um, class suicide that uh, people might quietly turn themselves into less monstrous, greedy creatures. It's a sentimental idea if you can't prove that it's possible. Um, I mentioned the possibility that uh, maybe everybody would do some manual work, uh, which seems like I, a sentimental idea if I can't prove how that could be done without brutal coercion. Mm -hmm. uh, as I say, it's only my advanced age that, that makes me dare to do it. It is embarrassing if somebody says, um, if, you know, if, if, if someone describes their romantic troubles and and says, I'm lonely, I'm miserable. The last person I met uh, decided they hated me and I'm miserable. And if you say, hey, it's going to be great. Uh, you're going to meet a wonderful new person probably within 11 months. <laughs> that is embarrassing. It's, it's rude. It, it's because you can't prove it. So how do you, you know, um, square this circle? Is that the phrase? I mean, I think the last time we talked, you were talking about a book of essays that you had come out with. Before that, I think it was your extraordinary monologue, um, Fever. Um, you have written over and over again that you believe you come from a no use, good for nothing class of affluent people who are mostly crooks and parasites. And yet, you keep coming back to the page, and you keep coming back to the screen, and you keep coming back to the stage. It feels like a Godot, Beckett kind of an act of, of we'll do it again. What, what keeps you contributing, doing it again? Well, I tend to be quite, uh, I don't know. I. I I have a uh, somewhat uh, cheerful side to my personality. I enjoy writing, and I don't really plan what I write. It's something I do because I enjoy it, but then somehow more of me gets put into it. I don't really think everything about my background is... is uh, worthless. I, I talk in the book about uh, civilization 
And, uh, you know, it was a bad idea because of how much uh, hierarchy it led to and ultimately how much suffering it led to. But right now, we, we should really take advantage of the, the, um, the good things that it brought about, yeah. uh, which include books, uh, quite importantly, uh, because books are, to use a phrase Marx sort of used, books are the uh, congealed wisdom and thoughts of, of some of the smarter people who lived in the past. And uh, these will uh, help us to uh, escape from the brutal world that we're, we're living in. I can't help but remind people of the great Gandhi quote on arriving in England and being asked what he thought of Western civilization. He said, it would be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but to talk about books, we're here surrounded by books and an elevator that is plastered with quotes, including one from Richard Ford, which I think read something like, if loneliness is the disease, the story is the cure. Um, talk about this place as you understand it and what it represents as a part of that culture that perhaps we need to remember. Right, well, fiction is, of course, the most direct way that uh, people have to, to describe what it feels like to be a human being from the inside. If you take a writer like uh, Tolstoy, he really had a lot of insight into uh, what made people happy or miserable. Well, I mean, it's crucial to your political attitudes to know how people might possibly feel in different circumstances. Tolstoy, another one, being an aristocrat who gave up his Wealth, right? Yeah, well, he, he certainly, uh, at a certain point, uh, turned against his uh, background and speculated about what it would be like to uh, work in the fields. Nobody else other than fiction writers quite go at it so directly. And of course, books also tell us about the past, which is the basis for how you think you ought to act in the present. I mean, Trump has a theory about what went on in the past, which is the basis of his uh, system of beliefs. If you think that Iran is unfriendly to the United States because the people there are insane, you will have one point of view. And if you think that they are angry at the United States because of things that we did to them, you'll have a different point of view. And, you know, if you don't read, yeah. you're going to make up for yourself uh, what happened in the past. And you're going to base your current attitudes on uh, you know, what you imagine happened, and probably you're wrong. And this was a, you said, a maritime library. What is that? I think that this collection of books originated in the 19th century with the maritime library, and I may be wrong, but this was a library for sailors. Uh, and if I'm not completely wrong, the idea was that when they would land in New York, they would have a place where they would find books. And I think this library is, is uh, you know, originated in, in that, that world where it was taken for granted that uh, working people read a lot of books. I mean, and it's also, I myself in my book go into it a little bit. You do. 
I had one grandmother who was somewhat well educated, and I had another grandmother. My father's mother just went through the third grade. She wasn't educated, but all the same, she used to go to lectures with the other educated grandmother. So I love talking with you, Wally, and I could do it forever. Um, but I also love coming to see your work. And I, not so long ago, had a chance to see um, Nighttime in the Talk House. Evening at the e Talk evening House. Evening at the Talk House. Oh, this is amazing. When it was here in New York. And I was struck was by the quality that it had that reminds me of so much of your work this, and of you, this, of kind of fuming, like just slightly subterranean fuming. Fuming could go into giggles and laughs, <laughs> but it's also a kind of wake up, wake up, why aren't we, wo why aren't we more of us more woken up? Talk about that for a minute and, and how, where you think we are on, on the clock of survival. You know, we're, we're uh, drifting into the destruction of the entire planet and our species and every other species. And we're allowing the oppression of the oppressed. And somehow, we're, by drifting, we're compromising every day. And we're collaborating every day. Yes, we, we get up every day and, and fume about Trump and how evil he is, whatever. Uh, but um, most of us are just in a, in a trance. We're paralyzed, really. Many people, uh, you know, there are people who aren't, but most people really are. And every day that we, uh, you know, we stay in the trance and don't do anything to fight these horrors, uh, we are collaborating. Well, is that where night thoughts come in? I mean, aren't those visions of an alternative, as whimsical, as impractical perhaps as they are, what remind us that we're making a choice to keep collaborating, that we could be doing something else? Yes, I think, well, I mean, I think you have to have a vision of what the future could be, but then you also have to have the, the uh, courage, including, I'm afraid, physical courage uh, to, uh, you know, to take steps in, in the right uh, direction. I mean, I'm, I'm suspicious of those of us who stay out of prison. I think if you are uh, arrested, it's kind of a good clue that you might be on the right track. Those of us who are walking around enjoying life, you have to sort of, it's, it's more ambiguous. Uh, are you contributing anything? <laughs> Probably not. Maybe, you know. I guess I'll see you on the barricades. <laughs> Wally Sean, thank you so much for the work, for coming in. The latest book is Night Thoughts. You can get more information about it at our website. Not long ago, former Vice President Al Gore called for the impeachment of Donald Trump. He's not the first to call for impeachment, nor will he be the last. But what would it take to impeach not a person, but the system of which he is a product? That's the question activist philanthropist Ed Whitfield, co-director of the Fund for Democratic Communities in Greensboro, North Carolina, was raising a few months back when we had a chance to connect at a meeting of the New Economy Coalition in Chicago. Here's Ed. I have been a political activist pretty much all of my life. I've spent a lot of time reading, studying. I've worked 35 years in industry, uh, kind of self-funding the political activity that I did when I got off work. Uh, that included runs for political office, it included community organizing, spending a lot of time talking to working class people. And I found in the course of talking to people that a number of people are kind of eager to hear kind of refreshing uh, ideas of how we can understand the world and how we can be behave in the world. We have an idiot as the President of the United States. One of the things I also think about, though, is that 
people who are more connected with an understanding of reality, but deeply entrenched with the exploitative system that we're a part of, uh, would be at the helm otherwise, and not as many people would be noticing the kind of absurdity of what's going on in Washington. Um, so he, he calls attention to the presidency in Washington in a way that other people as president would not. And hopefully there will be some people who will be able to benefit from thinking about it more deeply than they would have in the kind of business as usual neoliberal globalist thinking that uh, have previously occupied the office for, for the last several years. The calls for the impeachment of the president right now are a little scary to me because I think that the people who are next in line behind him are in many ways as bad and possibly in some ways worse by virtue of the fact that some of them possibly have more stable connections with uh, power bases within the Congress um, and within the states that they can utilize. So th his impeachment wouldn't make me feel really great because I don't think that the people who are in line behind him are going to be really beneficial to the causes that I really care about. Politics becomes a, a consumer activity and the producers allow you to choose between Coke and Pepsi but if you really want some healthy fruit juice it's really not an option. Um, so I don't think that, that the American people had good options on the final ballot for the, for the presidency and I think that we're going to have to do a whole lot of more work in the future about being producers of the reality that we want to see rather than simply approaching it as consumers. The metrics that we use when we're trying to evaluate whether something is interesting to us in terms of the work that I do with the Southern Reparations Loan Fund and the co-op development work that we do with the Fund for Democratic Communities has to do with whether or not we are transforming ownership, shifting ownership to working class people and their communities, and whether or not we're building stable enterprises that are capable of being self-sustaining and are not going to require ongoing subsidy. These enterprises have to be democratic in nature where the people who are in them and the communities that they are part of actually have some say in setting the direction of them and controlling the operations in such a way that the benefit to the community is built into how it operates democratically. Uh, right now some of the most progressive movements that I know about inside the United States are small, um, certainly un underfunded, that aren't uh, dynamic or sexy in some kinds of ways, uh, but ultimately lead toward new possibilities that will grow uh, as the economic crisis deepens. I remain excited, I'm optimistic, uh, I see around me growing new movements, brand new folks coming into activity, uh, learning things from each other. I certainly see a lot of mistakes being made, but that is to be expected. Um, we are capable of learning from our own mistakes, even though typically what we do is repeat them, but we can learn from them, and part of the role of organizers is to, again, enable people, empower people, uh, encourage people to do what it is that they're capable of understanding and doing for themselves. The removal of monuments and memorials dedicated to the Confederate States of America has been gaining steam ever since the Charleston Church Massacre of 2015, and has taken off after the racist Unite the Right uprising in Charlottesville this summer. Dedicated to those who fought and killed for the Confederacy, which before the Civil War supported the extension and expansion of slavery, the vast majority of those monuments were erected in the Jim Crow era to intimidate African Americans seeking civil rights. No matter, say their defenders, they're simply about honoring history. When he was just a Republican Alabama senator, Attorney General Jeff Sessions called removing the Confederate flag from public buildings an effort by the quote unquote left to delegitimize the fabulous accomplishments of our country. Well, let's think about that. Jeff Sessions and Donald Trump and I might disagree about the Civil War, but when it comes to throwing off British colonial rule, I bet we'd agree about that. To celebrate that accomplishment, how about we erect some monuments to the Motley Crew? As Peter Leinbaugh points out in his important book, The Multi-Headed Hydra, slave revolts and slave trade mutinies were the real precedents of the events of 1776. You want heroes? How about Tacky, the leader of a 1760 slave rebellion that raged for months in Jamaica? Tacky's revolt left 60 whites and several hundred slaves dead after it was suppressed by colonial troops. 
but it inspired revolts across the Caribbean and into New England. The 1760s and 70s saw enslaved Africans organize rebellions in, among other places, Alexandria, Virginia, Perth, Amboy, New Jersey, Norfolk, Virginia, and Charleston itself. Those uprisings got good coverage in the Quaker publications of their day. Tom Paine was certainly aware of them. He wrote about the multiracial mobs of blacks and natives, along with Irish teagues and so-called saucy boys, as he put it, and rowdy women who protested the Stamp Acts and the Tea Act long before the Boston Tea Party. Those rebels drew inspiration from, from the English diggers and levelers who opposed peonage and bondage of every sort to bosses, parliaments, kings, or profit. They set the scene for what even Jeff Sessions surely would count among the country's fab fabulous accomplishments, the Declaration of Independence. So how about it? For history's sake, how about some monuments to that motley crew of black and native and rowdy Irish and saucy whites? I can see it now. What great monuments they'd be, for history's sake. You can write to me. Tell me what you think. I'm Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com. And thanks.